Uh, okay, can you all see that now? Yes, we can. On. Perfect, brilliant, thank you. Um, okay, so hi, yeah, thanks for the intro. My uh, name is uh, Katie. I'm a postdoc working at the Marine Biological Association in the UK, uh, doing work on marine heat waves. And I'm just gonna talk to you a little bit today about some of the work we're doing. Um, okay, I'm gonna give a little bit of background on heat, marine heat waves, so I'm not sure uh, what background everyone has and, and how much they know. So essentially, um, as we all know, the oceans are getting warmer and in line with that, we're also seeing heat waves in the ocean, just like we see on land. Um, so they're essentially discrete periods of anomalously warm water that are occurring in addition to background climate change. So if you see this, this uh, global map on the side, this just gives you an example of um, uh, notable marine heat waves that have occurred over the, the last 25 years. And you can see they can occur anywhere in any sea, any ocean. Um, and we get these big blobs of, of warmer than average water where sometimes the, the water is increasing to temperatures as much as five degrees above the, the background temperatures for the time of year and location. So the most commonly used definition of a marine heat wave is a period of five or more days where water temperatures are warmer than the 90th percentile based on the 30 year historical climatology for the time of year and the location. So if you have a look at the the figure on the left hand side at the bottom you can see a blue line which is your average temperature for time and location um, over the last 30 years. The green line above it gives your 90th percentile threshold over that time and then the black line is your today's temperature as it is and you can see if the, back, if the black line goes above the green line then we start to get heat spikes and if it goes above that 90th percentile threshold for um, five days or more, then this becomes what we classify as a marine heat wave at this point. Um, and just like many other things, um, uh, in line with global warming, marine heat waves are becoming um, increasingly common and uh, increasingly um, uh, increasing intensity um, as we go through time. So within any event, the category of the heat wave can vary from moderate to extreme, um, as the difference between the threshold temperature and the recorded temperature varies so you have your average temperature and then above that you have your threshold and once you pass that threshold you have a moderate marine heat wave now if you take that difference between the average and the threshold and you go to two times that height you get a strong heat wave and then they become incrementally um uh, more intense so you get then severe and then extreme and just to give you an idea of, of how that could vary um on the right hand side here you can see a marine heat wave that happened uh off the coast of Western Australia in 2011. Um, now you can see with both um, spatially and um, with, durate, with time, the heat wave varies from moderate to extreme if you look at the different colors and different areas of the coast were impacted over time with different levels of um, severity of heat wave. Um, and just to kind of drive home some of the impacts that heat waves can have and, and why we're looking at them, if you look at the two pictures above, so A and B, um, just on the right hand side there, um, A gives you an example of a lush kelp forest that was found off this coast of Australia um, uh, and has been since since time began, well, not then, but, um, but you know, since, um, since as long as people can remember. And this one particular heat wave event caused a 100 kilometer uh, range contraction of the, of the seaweed of this kelp um, and the B, the picture on the side, um, is, is what's left now. So we have these turf algae, very low level turf algae, which don't have the same three dimensional structures. Um, and more than a decade later, none of the kelp has recovered and we still just have these <clears throat> turf algae there. Now today I'm gonna talk to you about um, so what we've been doing, focusing on marine heat waves of a strength that's strong and above. And the reason we look at these is because this is where we start to see the more significant impacts of marine heat waves. Um, we also focus on summer months rather than winter because uh, organisms are living closer to their thermal maxima. So again, we see larger impacts of marine heat waves in the summer months. So this is generally where our research focus is at this point. So what do we know about marine heat waves so far? Uh, we know the impacts can be significant. So we can, for example, we can get mass mortality. Um, we can uh, have huge shifts in habitats in relation to them. And if you have a look here, all these white boxes on this very simple figure here, um, just give you an idea of um, the global expanse uh, of uh, impacts we've seen that affects um, foundation species all over the world. Um, now, 
the work we're doing currently is looking at foundation species, but I'll come back into that in a minute. But yeah, this is just to show you that um, this is where we've seen broad impacts of marine heat waves all over the world. And this isn't, we don't just see impacts, uh, sorry, start again. Um, we also know that the impacts, um, we also see huge impacts in relation to ecosystem services. So this figure is very busy and I don't expect you to take too much away from it, but all it's telling you is that um, globally, marine heat waves have impacted provisioning services, regulating services, habitat services, and cultural services uh, everywhere. And in that way, the majority of large marine heat wave events start to impact us as humans. And this is generally why we care at the end of the day. So just to put some of that into monetary values, uh, just to give you an idea of, of the kind of extent uh, of, of impacts these heat waves can have. Um, uh, in around 2016, 2017, there was a large marine heat wave off the coast of Chile, southern Chile, uh, which caused um, harmful algal blooms. Now these harmful algal blooms led to huge mortalities in the farmed fish down there, which led to a loss of 800 million US dollars in export just for that one season alone. And similarly in 2010, the um, marine heat waves in Southeast Asia caused huge bleaching, mass bleaching of coral reefs um, and the loss to tourism because people were less interested in, in visiting bleached reefs um, was somewhere in the, in the value of 50 to 75,000 for local operators around Southeast Asia. So we're seeing huge, huge um, impacts of these marine heat waves. So we wanted to start building an understanding of how marine heat waves of different magnitude impact different species to see if we could start to see the relationship between some of the more major marine heat wave metrics um, and uh, foundation species. So we were looking at things like, uh, how long do marine heat waves last? How intense are they? What's the, uh, what's the highest temperature we reach? Um, and we're looking at how they then impact uh, foundation species. So we're focusing on foundation species because the impacts of these species are disproportionately high compared to uh, many other species in the environment. So in any marine environment, the foundation species are essentially the identity of the environment. And if they disappear, the entire community changes. So this is where we're focusing right now. And the work we're doing is looking at uh, kelp forests, seagrass beds, um, non-coral habitat forming invertebrates like these Gorgonians uh, and coral reefs. So to start to investigate how marine heat waves are impacting these areas, the first thing we did was uh, identify time series data sets for these four different groups of foundation species where we could find long time, um, long series of, of data where we had either changes in densities of um, kelp or seagrass, or bleaching events or mass mortality events occurring all over the place. We then explored for every single location that we, um, that we had data for, we explored marine heat waves that had occurred in those areas. And as I said before, we were looking for strong summer marine heat waves. And then once we'd done this, we cross-referenced um, all of our data um, uh, for every location we had, and we pulled up every overlap where we had time series data and a marine heat wave events occurring um, and had a look at, at what we could see there. Okay, so just to give you an idea, kind of a better idea of what we did. Um, this is an example from uh, off the coast of California and it just gives you an idea of uh, how we um, kind of worked through our data. So at the top, you can see um, 40 years worth of climatology. Um, there's a a package called Heatwave R, if anyone is using R and, um, and uh, wants to look at marine heat waves, which will pull up for any location your climatology. So we, we pulled up for the coast of California, this particular area, the climatology over the past um, 40 years. And you can see the red arrows above just indicate where there was a strong summer marine heat wave. And then underneath, you have your change in kelp density. So this is Macrocystis, one of the main kelp species um, over there. Uh, and you get your density on the side and you've got about 20 years worth of data. So here you can see we've got two different periods where there were summer marine heat waves um, and we have kelp data from before to after so we can start to, to look to see how the kelp has changed during a marine heat wave event. So kind of in, in closer context we um, for each event we then took uh, a couple of years before um, if we could and looked at the natural variability 
Um, and then we looked at uh, a year or so after, and we looked at the difference between the averages of density of, of kelp in this example, um, from before to after, and kind of took that as a, um, uh, a response to the marine heat wave. Um, so for, for, we did the same for, for seagrass and for bleaching and mass mortality events, we, we just looked at occurrence of bleaching or occurrence of mass mortality events that fell straight after or, or just after marine heat waves. Okay, so what did we find? Well, first of all, we managed to find data from 1,365 sites globally where there were heat waves occurring, strong summer heat waves that occurred at the same point as um, uh, we had data for, um, and these across 72 eco regions. So it's a good global kind of expanse that we've got here. Um, if you have a look on the right hand side, these are all the different data sets that I used, um, that we used. They are all freely available, uh, big intense data sets, but if any of you want to know any more about them, my email address at the bottom of all the slides. So feel free to contact me and I can either give you a list of them or, or any other information you are interested in in these. Okay, once we found all this data, the first thing we did was kind of a blanket analysis to determine how foundation species were impacted within each region. So this again is an example for kelp here. And it just gives you an idea of um, how kelp responded in different eco regions to marine heat waves. So we averaged the data from sites within each eco region um, and then looked at changes in kelp from before to after, as I said. Um, so you can see here for every location, on average, we're seeing about 50 to 60% of the time, we're seeing a loss of kelp in relation to marine heat waves, which is no great shocker. We all know that they're, they're damaging to the environment. Um, however, what was a bit of a surprise is around 20% of the time we're instead seeing gains in relation to strong summer marine heat waves. So based on this, we then had a look at how species responded across their point in range, across, across their entire uh, distributional range. So we separated species by trailing edge, mid and leading range edges, and looked at how marine heat waves affected species in each of these distribution points. Okay, so first of all, for our animals, so for the corals and the uh, invertebrates, um, we found uh, at the warmer range edge, we were seeing larger impacts than at the cooler range edge. So more corals being bleached, more invertebrate mass mortality events are happening. And similarly, for our plants, we again see a same, the same kind of thing where at the warmer range edge, we're seeing a real decline. Um, but at the warmer, cooler range edge, we're actually seeing an increase on average in response to these strong summer heat waves. So it just goes to show anything you're doing, the importance of, of taking into account where the species is in its point in range and, and how that affects its, its thermal capacity. Okay, so after this blanket analysis, we wanted to start looking within eco regions as uh, to see if we could determine in any eco regions um, if there were relationships uh, between the marine heat wave characteristics and the responses we're seeing. Um, we narrowed this down by ecoregions just to try and take out some of that, um, that thermal effect from, from species ranges. Um, uh, so this, uh, doing this, we kind of also limited our data to anything that had um, 10 or more data points in, which left us with 29 ecoregions globally. And we ran general linear models to uh, compare our responses to the marine heat wave characteristics that we were looking at. So, um, duration and maximum intensity, the average intensity, the cumulative intensity, which takes into account the length of time and how warm the water is over that length of time, and the maximum absolute temperature. So what do we find? We found pretty much for every foundation species and eco region, there were significant relationships between marine heat wave characteristics um, and some of the impacts we're seeing. Um, sorry, I thought my, my daughter was coming in then. Um, so just to show you some of the impacts that we saw, this is just for um, the Caribbean. So this gives you an idea for some of the coral reefs we were looking at in the Caribbean. Uh, and you can see that the two most common parameters for, and we found this across the board for coral reefs, that kind of predict how a reef's going to respond during a marine heat wave is the maximum intensity of the heat wave and the maximum absolute temperature. So this just gives you a couple of examples. So these are many reefs off the coast of Florida where we see a significant relationship. Um, and although coral bleaching remained quite low level across the heat waves, we see this significant increase um, in bleaching with increasing maximum absolute temperature. And then in the Greater Antilles on the right hand side, um, it's a much more clear cut pattern. And once the temperatures get above about 30 degrees, um, we're seeing huge 
levels of leaching. And this was kind of the more common pattern we saw across the board. Most um, most reef areas we found that above 30 degrees, we're seeing this huge increase in bleaching. So just to show you our overall findings, again, this is a very busy figure, but this gives you our 29 eco regions where we have compared uh, the different marine heat wave characteristics to um, different foundation species responses. And you can see in general, we've got these significant relationships uh, linking the foundation species uh, with these different marine heat wave metrics. Um, and if we can start to scale this up, we can start to understand how marine heat wave impacts of um, foundation species in different parts of the world and begin to predict how these marine heat waves will, um, or how foundation species will respond to marine heat waves in the future, which hopefully will start to, to guide management. So as we all know, nothing's ever quite as clear cut as we'd like. Um, so we're working towards developing the understanding of these relationships between marine heat wave characteristics and foundation species. And as marine heat wave forecasts improve, we'll be able to hopefully guide better management decisions and start to predict better what's going to happen in the future. Um, but doing this also provides us with some um, hypotheses to start testing in the lab. So this is one thing we're doing back at home is running lab experiments um, to support what we're seeing in the field, just to try and understand if we can see the same, same kind of responses. Um, yeah, and that's, that's the kind of direction we're going in right now. Um, and just to finish, this is the lovely team that I get to spend lots of my time working with. So a thanks to them. A thanks for um, all of you guys for listening. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you very much.